Okay, so you have a book coming out that's set in the Eberron universe, but this has a very unique flavor, correct? This is coming out later this year? Uh, that's correct. So it's called Frontiers of Eberron Threshold. And this is a whole thing that sort of spun out, you know, we did um, uh, Exploring Eberron, mm -hmm. which was sort of a collection of random things I like about Eberron. Uh, and I started working on another book with Wayne Chang, uh, the producer, you know, with uh, KB Presents, that was a more general sort of topic, sort of, uh, you know, a follow up to Exploring Eberron, uh, and then ended up Basically, uh, I'm running an online campaign for my Patreon campaign, and I like the setting for that so much that I basically was like, well, I'd like to expand on this and create this book. We uh, sort of joke, we, we call the project FRAG, R-A-F-G, because it's essentially the Frontier Adventurer's Guide. Uh, you know, in that same way, like with Sword Coast Adventurer's Ga Guide, that it is focusing on a particular region of Eberron in greater depth than most of the previous books do. Uh, and sort of looking at what you get out of running a campaign in this area. This is the um, border between Droam and uh, Brayland. Droem being the nation of monsters that mm -hmm. has just emerged in the last 10 years. And this ties to the fact that over the last couple of years, someone asked me how you do a sort of Western campaign in Eberron. And I originally ran a number of, of long-term campaigns on the other side of the continent in uh, Kabara. But as we started working on things, I realized I really liked the dynamic of this area at the edge of Brayland. Uh, in the West, um, because what you have is this expanding nation of monsters. And rather than, in a sense, the more colonial gold rush vibe that you get in Kabara, this is essentially about the point that there's this nation that the rest of, you know, the human nations, if you will, have dismissed, and yet is growing stronger and more powerful, and that is itself this blend of all the different monstrous cultures. And so Threshold, uh, the town of the title, is basically the last Braylish town on the edge of Drowan. Okay. And so it's the last stop before Monsterville, if you will. <laughs> and the idea is it's not that it's become a bigger thing because of gold or because of something like that. It's that now that Droam is becoming a place where merchants want to make deals, the mm -hmm. dragon marked houses want to invest, but they want to stay in the last possible. They want to get as close to it as they can without going over. And so it's this small mining town that is now bringing in the lightning rail has come, House Gandaric is building things. You have that sort of big companies coming in. Uh, but you're still on the edge of the frontier where the law doesn't have as great strength, where you have bandits, brigands, raids, smugglers, all these things going on. Um, so having rambled on that for a while, the whole sort of point is we wanted this sort of Western vibe. It's wand slingers and lightning rails uh, and to explore some of the elements of that genre. Um, but also that idea of essentially really narrowing the focus of a campaign. Mm -hmm. Often in an Ebron campaign, uh, it's this travel across the world, go to all these different places. It's Indiana Jones, you know, keep moving. Yeah. Uh, but what I found I really enjoy is this thing where you focus instead on a particular town. It's Deadwood and Eberron. And that part of the point of it is seeing how over the course of the campaign, the town evolves and your actions impact the town. Uh, and also having your characters actually essentially over time become much more important to the town, you know, that sort of focus on a small region instead of a big one. So Frontiers of Ebron. Yeah, that's, I, and I think uh, Deadwood's a fantastic example of like becoming invested in a town. Exactly. Uh, and how, I guess, as I said, one of the things I did that, that sort of drove this is I have a Patreon, just Keith Baker on Patreon. Uh, and in looking for ways, mainly it's just been supporting the articles that I write on my website, but mm -hmm. I was wanting to find something that was a little more engaging and interesting for patrons. So I'm running an ongoing live stream campaign, 
a set and threshold, but basically every session, it's an ongoing story. It's an ongoing cast of characters, but every session is a new group of players okay. drawn from among the patrons. And essentially when we started it, we built this cast of 10 characters um, sort of collaboratively through a series of polls. You know, I'd say, here's a list of five basic concepts. People would pick the two they like, you know, then take each one and say, well, what kind of character is this? What's their secret? What's their backstory? So part of what I like is even though at any given time, I'm only playing with five players, it's a story that all of the patrons are involved in and that we've built the town and these characters together every session, uh, before it runs, I sort of ask people like, here's a bunch of different things that could happen in this adventure, which do you want to see? And collaboration is what I love most about role playing is building a story together. And so this has been this interesting exercise in building a story with 400 people instead of with, you know, five people. Yeah. And that's, you're kind of filling out the entire population of this town with real players playing these NPCs or these, these PCs. Mm -hmm. Um, that probably become NPCs to some degree, but that's going to be really fun to like evolve a town and have that, that hyper focus and be able to kind of, fo you know, also like, you know, what is the economy of this town? Like who, exactly. who who's the, who are the de the shaker, the movers and the shakers on a very small level on a macro level. I think that's, that's uh, really fun because I think D and D in general tends to be very big and, well, and certainly you're either in a very big city or you're going across the plains but to be in like just a town where you take, take ownership right. is very fun. And, and that's the idea is the interesting thing is with, with the group I'm running now, uh, they actually shied away from some of the bigger roles they could have done with the Kabara campaign I ran at home. And it's certainly an option, you know, in the book we're writing, we suggest, you know, the point is you can be in the town and there is a sheriff or you can be the sheriff. Mm -hmm. You know, your paladin can be the sheriff. Your cleric can be the town preacher. And then it does have beyond the actual actions of going out and, you know, beating up monsters or exploring a dungeon. There's also a certain aspect of town leadership between that. How do you keep things going? What do you do when there's, uh, there's trouble? And that's again, why I like that Deadwood analogy is that, yeah, you may not start there at first level, but as things go, it's a chance to grow into a setting and sort of really sink roots in. And it's, this doesn't mean like, oh my goodness, my players can never leave this region. Yeah. But it means there can be a lot more depth than you think. And part of the point going back to the book is that there is a lot of stuff going on in this region because you're right next to Droem, you have diplomatic relationships, you have trade, you have, you know, this sort of threat of war. Could this area go back to war? Uh, but you also have deeper powers, the Lords of Dust, the Dalkir, Archfey, that part of the point of it is normally you're just cruising through an area, you know, in that Indiana Jones thing. You're not sticking around to really figure out what's going on. And this is a little more, you know, Deadwood or even Twin Peaks in the sort of let's take a little time and really actually get to know the things going on around us that you might not realize. Is there anything that was like surprising in running this campaign and, and, and writing this book that stood out like that? Again, that character investment had to be so sharp and real uh, from, from the get go. Well, as I said, it's been very interesting. The process of creating the characters collaboratively as we did, yeah. uh, I would basically um, you know, started off with sort of dividing it into five basic sort of classes, the muscle, the knowledge, you know, uh, and present sort of five options in each of those, which people would pick two of. Uh, and so part of it, like I said, is under the muscle, you know, one of the characters was the sheriff mm -hmm. and people didn't pick, you know, the sheriff or the preacher. And so it is sort of interesting that overall people sort of didn't want to actually be the people in charge but they're still characters who all have a stake in the town. And, um, and so that's interesting. Uh, I'll say going back to the region, you know, to Frontiers of Eberron, a big part of it is, so it, uh, it deals with Threshold the same way that Rising from the Last <coughs> War deals with Sharn. Mm -hmm. And really the way I look at Frontiers of Eberron uh, is it's almost like if you just took Rising from the Last War, 
and just said, but it's just for this piece of the world. Right. So it's the same way that it starts off with character options and ideas that are unique to the region. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the details of things we've got, but I'll say you might see a picture of our warg character. One of the player characters in our game is a warg. Um, and then and goes... What is a warg for those that don't know? Oh, a warg is a wolf-like, uh, sentient wolf-like creature. So they're a little bigger than wolves and they have human intellect and can speak. Uh, and uh, there's a power group in Droam, the Dark Pack, that is wards and lycanthropes. And so part of the point of sort of saying we want things in this region is that there's a lot of monstrous creatures in Droam that aren't monsters. Mm -hmm. They're just your neighbors. They're building a kingdom of their own. And so things like kobolds, gnolls, wargs, you know, these are people that you should just be able to meet in town. Uh, you know, there is a considerable kobold presence in Threshold, for example. But basically, as I said, you're, we're starting with the what makes this the story of this region interesting. What's the general gazetteer of this region, including, you know, the fortress of Orkbone, Grey Wall, the larger town of Ardev, but then with Threshold taking that role of Sharn and Rising, like this is the one we're really going to dig into uh, because it is right in the middle of, you know, sort of where everything is going on. Uh, and then from there, more guidance for the game master about building adventures in this both sort of region and just sort of genre. You know, whether you do stick around, you could use this to guide adventures you tell in Kabara, for example, and then new magic items and monsters. Okay, so new magical items and monsters. Yep. Sounds like there's going to be some player options yeah, as well. Yeah, oh, there's... So th there's there's new archetypes, there's feats, you know, because again, we're all about what captures the mood. I mean, basically, you know, this is all about the wand slingers, yeah. I'm just going to say. And so we got a lot of <laughs> options uh, to make that possible. Right. Yeah. So this is very much a campaign setting book within a campaign. Exactly. It's, yeah. it's really, like I said, we're just taking a much smaller part of Eberron and saying, well, and here's the setting book for that setting. Um, and again, the big point is you could use it as a campaign setting, or you could use it as just a place you pass through on your way to your next thing. Either way, uh, it is that point that there's so much depth you can get in into in Eberron. And with exploring Eberron, I sort of dug deeper into some of the things I didn't have a chance to explore before. With Frontiers, it's like, and now we're just gonna take one piece and go even deeper, you know, and really uh, explore a region uh, in more depth. And that's something that's always been kind of key to when you look at uh, old Westerns and, mm -hmm. and films and stories is that there is almost always this economy portion. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> very, very much routed in. There's gold here. There are jobs here. There's something here of value of trade. And then the story sculpts itself kind of around that. And then you have these very interesting characters that kind of fill out that. What, what's key to running a what kind of a Western game or a, a frontier game or a game that is, you know, on the dangerous edge? You know, the well, Mos Eisley of Eberron sort of. Absolutely. And that's the point. Mos Eisley, Casablanca. You know, one of the points is to look at the things you don't have that the point is not all the services that we're used to having in Sharn are available, whether it's just literal services like, oh, they haven't managed to get the speaking stones working in Threshold yet, or if it's just things, you know, you can't always buy what you want. And, and I'll say that, uh, you know, I think it was Rhyme of the Frost Maiden is a good example where they did sort of lean into that as well. Ten towns are very much a sort of frontier mm. region. And you have that point that there's not a lot of access to things there. So you have that sense of uh, more limited things. And, and so the things you have, in a sense, matter more. And, uh, and what you do to get access to what you're looking for. And as I say, that idea that over the course of a campaign, the town is going to change, you know, things are building, things are expanding, people are looking for opportunity. Um, certainly here on, on the Western frontier, uh, the big point also is the neighbors, is it is this idea that here the monsters aren't just monsters, 
they are the people who own the country next door that's getting bigger. And it is that idea that your relationship uh, with them is important. That, you know, it's not just, oh, a bunch of kobolds, we should kill them all. It's a bunch of kobolds, oh, wait, hang on a second, which clan are they from? How are we doing with that? What is the impact of how we're going to interact with them? Um, there's also, I think, a little more of an aspect. This is different from Kabara with the Western frontier, but there's still that aspect of discovery and opportunity, that this is a place that uh, people don't really understand yet. We don't know what's out. You might bump into that vein of gold and suddenly your fortune is made if you can manage to hold on to it without other people uh, digging into things. And that's a big part of Eberron is that Eberron deals with a lot of aspects of history uh, that the modern civilizations don't know about. The Age of Demons, uh, the Dalkir and the Goblin Empire. And that's a big part of this idea of even though this isn't sort of an entirely new land people haven't discovered, essentially it's got a depth they haven't discovered. And what do you do when you stumble onto the altar from the Age of Demons that, you know, is basically pet cemetery? Do you just try and bury it and keep anyone from ever using it? Do you first you got to deal with the zombies, yeah. you know, that basically it's and it's a little more depth because you're not leaving. You know, you don't just move on to your next adventure. That creepy haunted graveyard is right there. And you've got to figure out how do we how do we reckon with it? You know, um, so that was a little rambly. But I mean, basically, again, coming back to that point, the law is often going to be in your own hands. Uh, services you're used to may not be available. Um, there's things to discover. You're stumbling into things that nobody may actually understand. Um, and that again, here the monsters aren't actually just random monsters. They're your neighbors and, you know, they've got agendas and plots of their own. I love the idea of having like semi non humanoid, uh, the wargs, I think mm -hmm. is going to be very fun. Um, just you know, just watching uh, his dark materials recently. I think the door is wide open for non-humanoid races to be played in D&D. Exactly. And that's really what we're experimenting with the warg is trying that out. And uh, I love the warg character that we do have. And, you know, that's a, sen a, a point is that in a sense, what Threshold is, is a play test for Frontiers of Eberron. And uh, so far, I really enjoy uh, all the, the adventures we've had uh, with Jatarka, our warg character. But it is that, you know, fun to just play that sort of different perspective of, of uh, things. Uh, I, I like the the chance to also refer to, to humanoids as thumbs. Hey, thumbs, open the door. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but anyhow. What, uh, what, and, and so how soon are we going to be seeing this book? Uh, it's, where it's, still can ways, get... it's still a ways out, unfortunately. So uh, it's, it's going to be, I would say, you know, probably roughly a year after uh, Exploring Eberron. You know, I would say we're talking June, July. Okay. Uh, so it's a ways out. Uh, on the other hand, if you want to get a taste of it, again, you can find all the, the episodes so far of Threshold are available for audio and video on uh, my Patreon. So, uh, and, and I may put them out to the wire audience uh, soon. Right now, really, this is all such an experiment right. that I'm just doing it as a thing for my patrons. But, uh, but even if you just go to my website, which is keith-baker.com, uh, you can find some discussions of it and, and things like that. A huge, huge thank you to Keith Baker for that wonderful interview. If you want to support more interviews like this, just like this video, subscribe, click the bell, and set it so you are notified every time we publish a D&D video. You can also support us on Patreon as well, and that helps us buy equipment and keep the show going. I hope everyone's doing great. Thank you so much for watching.